Hey guys, Wednesday design video on a Thursday. Picking door casings, picking window casings, how to do it, what size they should be, where to find them, all of those decisions that may seem easy, it's not. Come join me. All right, in that other video, I talked about moldings and casings, and this is a local distributor who has moldings out, and these are door casings and window casings, okay? The problem is, and I pointed this out in, in that video, is that one, they're, they're mostly very ugly. None of these really follow any kind of historic precedent or historic deal. The largest one is this C22. And I remember Richard saying, C22, I know C22, we use that all the time. It was like a really common molding he was using around here. Well, there it is, okay? And I talked about moldings that have been in car wrecks, right? All the bumps and bruises and scrapes. Anyway, these are really terrible moldings, okay? They're too thin, okay? This, the biggest one is like an inch and a sixteenth. Most of them are 5 eighths to 9 sixteenths. Now remember, okay, pre-1920, 25, 30, before the, before the Depression, I should say, Moldings were almost always three quarters of an inch or thicker, okay? Now you get moldings that are half an inch, right? Two and an eighth inch colonial. There was no colonial molding that looked like that. I want to tell you right now, not only is it misnamed, it's ugly and it's terrible. So anyway, this is the problem. This is the challenge is that you've got moldings available from the catalogs. This isn't even a big box. This is a big lumberyard distributor and they've got ugly moldings. So why is that such a big problem? Okay, well, the best before and after I've got of a molding and the power of moldings, yes, I think there's power in moldings, is this door opening that was on a ranch style house that we were working on. And we took this simple door surround. We didn't raise the header. We didn't do anything. All we did was change the moldings and it dramatically changed the way you felt about this. Remember on moldings that they, they really are a language that communicates. And here's some door casings, okay? This is a Georgian door casing at Winter Tour. This is a federal door case in a winter tour. This is a French one, okay, from somewhere in Paris. This is the actual size. It's six inches wide by about three inches tall. It's massive, okay? The neoclassical or federal one, so this is 1760. This is 1810, let's say, and it's federal. It's only five inches wide. It's not as tall. And then look what the French did, okay, the, how different they are with the way they looked at moldings. The point is, is that moldings are a language that, that they communicate whether we're supposed to go through an opening or not, or which one's more important, okay? So understanding that this is the, maybe the, the precedent, right, for this historic style, where do they get that? Well, if I look at these, this is the layout for the Doric order and the Ionic order, and someone was asking, I really wish I could understand the math for putting that together. I'm gonna to do the math for you real quick. Basically, what it does in the Ionic system is it breaks open, it breaks open the wall into five parts, okay? So let's just say we have a 10-foot room, okay? Now, if I break it into five parts, each part of that room, okay, is two feet. Basically, they're saying that the entablature is one part, okay, which would mean your column, okay, is those other four parts. So there's my room laying out. There's my architrave, there's my frieze, there's my cornice running around the room. There's a 10 foot room broken out. It says down here that the architrave is 5 HD, the, the, and, the, and the Doric order, it's 1 half D, okay? So remember in this classical system, you have the architrave frieze and cornice, uh, which makes up your entablature over the column. The architrave is your door casing. So as you look at this system and you try to figure out this math, the architrave is the size of what your door casing, the architrave was used historically as the term for door and window casing. So what we're gonna do is each column is nine diameters, okay? So since I know that this is a 10 foot room and there are four parts, this column is an eight foot column. And I know the diameter of it because it says 9D, okay? So 9D means that if I divide eight feet, my calculator, divided by nine, I end up with 10 and basically three quarters, okay? That means that my diameter at the base is 10 and three quarters, okay? So typically in these scenarios, the architrave is one half of D, okay? So basically, if I know D, the diameter is 10 and three quarters, and I go one half D, basically I've got a five and a quarter inch architrave, okay? Five and a quarter inch architrave. 
Now, I'm gonna show you about two or three different ways of coming up with the size of the door casing based on you know, this classical system. In this situation, the architrave is one half D, so in the ionic order with a 9D column, I end up with a door casing that is five and a quarter inches, okay? So I, that, that's how wide my door casing is. Now remember this, that the, in the Georgian system, this was six inches, and in the neoclassical, it was five inches. So I'm right in that range. So this is how they ended up with those sizes, is they used the classical system to come up with this math, this proportional math to kind of figure out how it got put together. You can do all this yourself. You can end up fi figuring out the size of the cornices. That's what I was doing in that last video is helping you figure it out. But I can use this system to break out you know, how my moldings come together. So the problem is now understanding that those moldings, that the rough size for this system means my door casing should be around five inches. The largest door casing they got is that C22 right at four inches. That means I'm throwing out all of these other moldings because they're too small. Three and a half, that one's three and a half, that one's three and a half. Two and an eighth, two and a half. I looked through this whole catalog. I could only find one that was that was big enough. This fluty casing, I is five, it says five and a quarter. I don't think they'd necessarily mean it for a door casing, but if they did, five and a quarter, there they're getting close to the size that they need to be at. But we're talking about two moldings in this thing that are that are the right size, the wrong look, right? They, they these are not moldings that I would use. The other thing you notice about these moldings is that there is this, this three-step process in this classical architrave. There's this one, two, three step here is the way it's broken out. Same thing, one, two, three steps as it's broken out in the classical system. So basically we've got a very high, high order, right, that's figured out, okay? And the way I would approach the moldings, the way if I'm designing moldings and, and I would build this hierarchy is that the very first one is I would be four inches wide. That would be my minimum. So here's my four inch version of the, of the molding. And it's basically a one by with a little back band on it. Now the back band is something that I have been able to find in kind of most lumberyard catalogs. The back band, it has a number of different shapes, but this is a very simple way of getting kind of this hierarchy of moldings. So remember this, this door header I showed you with the pulvinated freeze, notice what this door casing is. It's a one by with a bead on it and this little back band, right? So there it is. There, that's what I've just drawn is that little back band there. And if you can get the bead on it from Windsor or Kukin, then you're doing even better. But there's kind of step one as far as door casings, as far as how these things get put together. Step two is I might go start getting, and this is, this is probably going to be about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half. Okay, somewhere, somewhere in that way, kind of some depth there. The next one, I'm just going to do the same thing, and I might have two steps there, right? And not, as, not, a, not very elaborate, just kind of simple drop downs. And this might be in the four and three quarter to five inch range, okay? And then I'm going to have an even nicer and it's going to step down and there's going to be a profile there and I would definitely have a bead on this thing, right? And so this one's going to be in the five to six inch range and this is going to be like that Georgian molding, probably in the two inch to two and a half inch range here. This is in the two inch range, maybe inch and three quarter, right, in that range. And so if you look at this molding, right, there's, there's something that is about two inches wide five inches long. And of course, this one's been elevated even more because it's been ornamented on all those steps. But you're seeing a bead on the edge, a little step down molding here. And so there can be this hierarchy of moldings that you would have in your house that you would have maybe upstairs, simpler moldings, downstairs around important things. And then around the front door, you might have this molding. They all speak to each other because they all have this same profile right at that back band, right? That is what's similar to all of these and it starts unifying and pulling them all together, but there's a size and there's a hierarchy. Now, if you just have a simple house, this might go everywhere. And maybe you're going down to three and a half inches around closets and things like that. Picking moldings and, and using things needs to start with that four inch range. I wouldn't get any smaller than that. And realize that that threw out 
90% of those moldings that were available in that local catalog. So now what do you do? I'm going with very simple moldings. I'm actually picking a one by four and using a back band to make my casings because I don't see anything in there I like. Nothing in there that's gonna help me put that together. The nice thing about Cukin and Windsor is they've got classically designed moldings and details that are that are that are beautiful and good looking, and so that I can I can organize these things. And even with Cukin, we did things where we elevated the Greek Revival, let's say, and there's you know three and a half, four and a half, five and a half sizes in that thing, which really makes it great to put inside your house because as rooms change and moldings change, they can grow and they can change. Now, the last piece of this thing is kind of elevating an entrance because in this case what if I didn't want to just put a door header on that opening what if I wanted to kind of tie it into this whole whole thing so here's kind of what we did right this is this was the the elevation we put onto it right where we just did a pulvinated freeze and a cornice above that thing and I think it was nice right that's this is this is what we did we built it out on top of, of this and it looked really pretty okay the other thing that you could do, and there's a nice little trick, is actually take your cornice up here, okay, and your, your door down here, and then connect those with the panel, okay? So basically what I'm doing is I am tying those two things together with an enlarged panel, okay? And, and I've done that with just a, a big wide piece. And what happens is, is when this gets painted, it just lifts your eyes right to the ceiling and it ends up tying it together because this then ties into that crown that runs around the room and it unifies that whole space the cornice of this element ends up being the crown that wraps around the whole room. So there's ways to unify and pull these things together. So from the very simple where you're just doing this to the very elaborate where you're bringing in the full entablature and tying into the house, this is the way to create you know, hierarchy, elevation, beauty into your projects, really communicate where you're trying to go, what you're trying to teach. I'm standing in the entry, where do I go? Oh, look at that entry. That's definitely where I want to go. That looks important. I'm going in there versus the other two ways. where Maybe there's a bathroom and a closet. You would never elevate it that way. But now with these door casings, you've got a door casing that you can be very simple with. You've got a door casing you can be more elaborate. And, and there's a dial here. You know, the highest end of the dial is this, right? Where you're actually carving into it. You're adding ornamentation on top of it. But even on the simple level, I don't have to have any carving and I can have a very nice, very elevated interior with just simple molding, simple details. And that's really the problem with most molding catalogs today is they're just not simple enough. They're too elaborate. They, they're, they're, they've been in car wrecks and they're trying to sell these moldings like they're, they're not damaged goods and they're damaged goods. Remember the picture I showed you, the before and after, just the way moldings can change that space that really understanding these details really is the secret to kind of the lost art of building to really making your spaces magical. I'm Brent Hall, thanks for watching.